Whoops. This is what happens when you go live. Where is my back? Why is that not? <laughs> it's not disappearing. Interesting. I keep saying hide. Well, hello, everybody. How do you know you're at Susan's live? Is it something like that happens, right? <laughs> Welcome to a pop-up Saturday live stream with my friend Maria Gerke. And I see Philippa and Margaret and Sandy's popping in to say hi before dinner. Hey, Roxanne. It is cold in New Zealand and Australia today. There's Sharon. So happy to see people here. And I am so glad to have Maria join me today. Some of you might already know Maria from uh, Instagram and TikTok where she's been super active. And now she's joining us over on YouTube. So I hope that a lot of my YouTube followers will go over and check out her channel. And she's got some time lapses going over there and she does beautiful watercolor art. So welcome Maria. Thanks for hanging out with me today. Yeah, thank you for having me. And who else I saw somebody else pop in and disappear? Hi, bye, Sandy. Yep. I'll chat with you later. That's not a problem. Well, let's look at what we've got on our tables. I'm going to switch my camera and I want to know who's doing what today. And if you're doing anything exciting for the 4th of July, and then I want to talk to Maria about what's going on on her table there. <laughs> Hi, Corey from the Netherlands. Lovely. Journal Breeze, that would be Kim. Welcome. And we should have Maria's channel down in the um, down in the description box. I'm looking at the screen here and I'm wondering why I can't get the full stuff, but I guess I guess we're gonna take what we've got, right? So Maria. Tell us, is this how you start a project, a watercolor project? Yeah, so usually what I do is I have, um, sometimes I do it on the table. Um, and lately I've been doing it on this clipboard because then I can, you know, use both sides. <laughs> oh, that's also, And also it gives me, if I do this side, it gives me a little bit of a angle, which is something. Ah. So I have, right now I have two projects um, outlined. Sure. Um, I don't know if you can see it. No, it's a little hard to see because it's pencil. Um, and I have this one here. Nice. And um, yeah, I usually tape it. So it doesn't, you know, when I paint on it, it doesn't curve or um, so that, you know, it's kind of contained in itself. And I know nothing about watercolor, so this is all brand new to yeah, me. Yeah, <laughs> so when you put the water under the under the watercolor paper, you, uh, the, the paint it's very watery, so it might you know make your pa paper wavy. There's some techniques where you don't have to do that, but um, I usually do that, and then it stays flat. So now, if you've got wavy paper when it's all when you're all done, is there anything you can do to Straighten it out afterwards. Hey, Barbie. And that is my friend, Maria. Hi. It's with me. <laughs> okay, you probably won't hear me chatting quite as much because um, I want to see all the stuff that Maria is doing. But I'm going to tell you real quick, but, and then I'm going to turn it back over to Maria. I just did my typical thing. I've got a piece of felt with some fabric on it, and I threw down some fibers. I'm just going to couch it down while we're chatting here. Hey, Hummer. So what can you do if your paper's all wet and like, I, I know me, I have grabbed a couple times some watercolors and just played with them in a sketchbook and I put just some uh, parchment paper behind it and then I end up with all the wavy papers. So is there something I can do afterwards to, you know, can you iron it? Do you weight it down? Does that help? Yeah, so definitely pressing it with something heavy helps or you can, you can also iron it um, if you use some parchment paper. Um, or do on the other side. Just have to be careful not to, uh, so it's not too hot, right? Um, but yeah, you can definitely iron it. Now, the reason why I tape it down to not have it baby while I'm painting is because then you get the color pools in the, you know, where it's lower. Okay. And then it's not even. Um, it, it can give you some cool effects if you just want to, you know, paint for fun and 
just do some shapes and some nice watercolor effects because watercolor definitely has interesting effects when it interacts with just wet paper or with each other. Be safe there, Barbie. If you have to take off, we understand. So Sharon asked a question. She says, I was under the belief that you should spray a little water on the back of your paper to stop it from curling. Is that right? Yeah, you can do that. You can do that if you if you wet it from the other side. Um, then you, But you also have to wet it from the top side then as well. So it ah. really depends what kind of watercolor you want to do. If you want to do wet on wet, um, so you make the paper wet and then you use the, or moist, and then you use watercolors on it. Um, but I'm right now, I'm doing wet on dry because um, it gives me a little bit more crispy um, contours. But yeah, sometimes it's a mix too. So now, one of the things that I've never, and I've known Maria for a little while through the um, coaching program that I'm in. See, now this is typical Susan. I've already got a knot in my thread, so we're just going to roll with it. Um, but I didn't know, she, Maria also has a podcast about mindfulness, so I you do. can um, check that out as well. But how did watercolor come into your life? So originally... Um long time ago I um, I went and did some art with um, an artist in Germany where I'm from oh just disclaimer I'm from Germany <laughs> originally um, and that was mostly oil and uh, when I came here and I wanted to get back into art um, I was just like oh, I can't really do oil inside and I don't have the space and it's just so stinky and it takes forever. So I decided I wanted to try something else. And and I really, I had done, you know, some watercolor as a kid and I really always liked the, the look of it. So yeah, so that's why I started doing that and um, kind of stuck with it right now. I have done a few non-watercolor um, artworks just recently, actually I did an acrylic one. Um, and yeah, but uh, this is my go-to pretty much. Denise wants to know what tape you are using. So there is different tapes. Um, some people use really fancy artist tape. Uh, what I'm doing is just the painter's tape, like the, you know, when you, for painting um, walls and stuff. Nice. Normal white. Easily accessible and not yep. expensive. I'm a big fan of that. <laughs> And it actually does uh, come off pretty easy, um, depending on the paper. I mean, if the paper is a little bit cheaper, um, it might rip a little bit, so you have to be a little more careful. And sometimes when I work um, for a little while, it, it might lift off a little bit, then I'm just gonna, I just press it back down. And usually that works. And if not, then I'll just take it off and put new tape on. That works too. Welcome, Denise. I don't think I said hello to you. I don't know that I've seen you here in our lives before, but uh, welcome. Margaret said, I started learning to use watercolors two years ago. Not done much lately. I love the chemistry of the colors and paints. You don't get that with acrylic. Yeah, absolutely. I can make mud real well with the watercolors. That's what I do. I can't seem to blend the colors very well. <laughs> Yeah, I, I like that it's not all uniform and it's, it's just a completely different process too. It is. Um, it, because you can't really layer, like you kind of have to leave, start with the lighter colors and like leave it open. Um, otherwise, um, because it's translucent, right? So. Um, Barbara said, watercolors remain aloof for me. I occasionally dabble, but just that. Yeah, me too, Barbara. It just seems like, um, I'll start off strong, you know, I'll have, I can sketch out a leaf and then I'll grab some green and start to play with it a little bit. And then before I know it, I've got, you know, not everything's outside the lines. I can't stay within the lines. I use too much water or too much paint or not enough water, not enough paint. I do better if I'm using like a Neo color crayon and a water brush, I can do a little bit better with that. I think, um, I'm not, cautious and well you know and it's me I don't follow any kind of rules so I don't pay attention to what you probably should be doing so I um right. 
Yeah, and one of the things with watercolor, it just takes a while to get used to because um, exactly what you're saying, like the amount of water makes such a difference and also being consistent with that. You know, <laughs> when you like paint one end and then, you know, you want to have the kind of the same light, you know, how light it is. Consistent, yeah. Susan, yeah, consistent tough. art that doesn't seem to go together, right? It's like... Right. A <laughs> Yeah, Barbara says, make a lot of mud, then I'll give up and end up with something I like in spite of it. Yep. I end up, I could do nice background papers for journals with watercolor because yeah. then I wasn't trying to do anything. But then I'm also not a confident drawer because um, drawing is what got me kicked out of arts and art class and mm. was the reason that I didn't make art for 40 years. Um, mm. You know, got kicked out of that class because I couldn't draw and ever since then, anything that, that was, had to be representative was very difficult for me. I just still have a lot of internal blocks around it. Mm -hmm. Have you always yeah. been like a sketcher? Um, not really. I, I think I'm, I'm, I've gotten a lot better. Um, um, I've done a few like figure painting classes as well. That helps. Um, yeah, but I don't really sketch. I'm too impatient for sketching. I <laughs> I do a sketch like before my painting, but I don't really have a, I mean, I have sketchbooks, but do I use them much? No. Like I have a lot of artist friends who do these elaborate sketchbooks that they like sketch every day and do little sketches. And I'm just like, I don't know. I just want to get right to it. Yeah. <laughs> So Sharon said, do you sketch your picture first, Maria? I'm not sure I trust myself to go blindly. I wouldn't know where to yes. start without a starting point. Now, sketch as in I make a pencil outline. I don't Here, know. Wait a minute. Let me it. let me make you full screen, see if we can see that. Hold it. Hold on. Hold on. One second. Let me see. The light is pretty bright, so it's kind of hard to see. I think you can see it maybe a little bit here on this side. Yeah? Yep. Yeah, okay. So yes, I do uh, um, a pencil outline. Now, some people like erase it. I usually leave it. Sometimes you can see the pencil a little bit in the finished painting, but I don't really mind it. I kind of like that. I kind of yeah. like seeing what the intention was. Yeah. And, Our, and I'm also not super accurate with it. I mean, yeah. I don't know if you can see it here, but um, sorry, it's like, but it, it's, you know, sometimes it's just like, like it's not a straight yeah. I don't, yeah. This is more so I know where to put what. And then usually I have some sort of reference pictures um, that I use for some of the things, um, for the lighting or something. Um, Got it. Usually it's more than one reference picture where I'm just, you know, oh, the tree is one and the cushion is one. And <laughs> this is what it is, by the way. This painting is an orange tree in the background, orange tree, and then these are cushions. Ah. So it's one of my um, portals. Portal. So Yes. Tell, tell me about the portals. I know a little bit about them, but how did this is sort of feels like you're combining your mindfulness practice with your art practice. Yes. And trying to invite other people to do the same thing. Yeah. So lately what I've been doing, um, I started out um, trying to get a program together where um, it's really kind of more like an experience but I'm also doing little ones now. So what I'm doing is, what I think I wanted to do is see that my art is kind of like a portal to a place, um, maybe something you imagine in your head where you can go when you're you know, really stressed or just need a break. Um, something, you know, and, and I've actually asked my followers, what's something, you know, if you, if you, could go there through a portal to relax, um, what would that be? And one of the answers was on an orange tree. And, 
yeah, what I really wanted to do with that is kind of convey this relaxation and um, tranquility in um, in this scene, right? Right. Um, because realistically, every art can be a portal to something because it is a scene of something. But um, yeah, I wanted to really get this to this headspace of, you know, where can you... I don't know. There's something that um, I've, you know, maybe some of you know from like therapy or you know stuff like that. This, this, uh, what is it? The mind safe space or right you know, mind palace or something like that. So obviously for everyone that looks differently. Um, so yeah, that's why I asked. Yeah, Barbara um, she said she just clicked on Maria's channel and she's streaming live right now too. This is a new thing if you don't know about it that uh, StreamYard is offering that we can stream, you know, the host can set it up so that the guests that they bring on can stream to their channel at the same time. So it's a really great way for us to do some cross pollination and help our fellow creatives get some different exposures to some different audiences. So I really love this idea and hope to be doing a lot more of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Margaret said watercolor has that serendipity factor. I agree and it's, it is great, like you said, for making textures and backgrounds. Great. Because watercolor has something a little like magical or like fantasy, dreamy, dreaminess. Right? I think it is. It's that like, dreaminess quality for sure. And I think, you know, I'm, I, I'm excited. Lately, I've been spending a lot of time on Pinterest. Well, I always spend a lot of time on Pinterest. But lately, I've been looking at it to see the wide variety of art that's out there. And it just kind of blows my mind to think about how many different styles and how many different creative mediums. And while one medium isn't going to speak to everybody, there's out there, there's got to be a medium that's going to speak to you and that is going to transport us. I know when I create something, I'm really trying to put my heart on the page and my energy. And those of you that watch me create, I know you can sometimes tell when I've got my energy into a piece or if I'm working on something that just feels forced you can tell it comes out flat. And I think that's something magical that art does for us. Uh, it really does take us someplace else and allow us to experience something maybe that's just in our head, but, but also I love Maria's idea of this portal that can just, you know, if we have our ideal place, I mean, like for me, it would be outside in a field of green to just center ourselves in this crazy world you know, just to get a chance to catch our breath. Sharon said, paintings are so beautiful. They really transport port you. I absolutely love behind your paintings, Maria. The, oh, yeah, I oh, see Margaret. Margaret. yeah, thank you, Margaret. And um, Thank you. Barbara's also posting the link to Maria's channel. I hope you guys will go over and subscribe and follow her so you can see as she's um, growing her channel over there. Oh, Sue, massive headache. Oh no. I'd make a good interviewer. <laughs> yeah, I think it'll be fun, you know, and I definitely, um, I know a couple of my UK friends want to do a stream and we'll learn to, to get to know them a little bit better. It's a chance for people that don't come to the monthly Zooms to get to know some of my fellow creatives as well. So I'm, I'm hoping we'll do some more of it. And those of you interested in the Zooms, I'm going to be putting up the July Zoom dates uh, later on today. So Maria, um, I'm going to give Maria a little sales pitch because she might not want to do it for herself. But Maria is doing commissioned portals for people. And if Maria, I'm going to say what I think I remember and then you can correct me. But I think what she's doing is she's going to, like if, if I was going to commission her to do a portal for me, she would ask me questions to lead me down this path to give her ideas of what is my mindful place? What is it that I need to center myself? And then she will create a piece of art that embodies that for me. Am I getting that right, Maria? Yeah. So this is um, what I called a uh, portal to your refuge. And I, I currently don't have it open, but um, at some point I'm going to open it again. Um, yeah. So the idea is that there's actually, you know, I 
a call where we can talk about you know what is this space and and all of the stresses that you have currently in your life like what's missing what what are you missing what are you looking for right and then um kind of translate that into a place that you can go to and um obviously it would be a little more elaborate than these little paintings i'm doing right now and the idea was to um, kind of combine that with um, a mindfulness practice, you know, some some sort of the meditation or journaling prompts or something that helps with the exact problems you're having right now and the place, you know, and also linked to the place that, that uh, you have in mind. Um, and then, um, yeah. And then I would paint that and also um, do like little sketches on the way, you know, while we like little versions of it. On the I way. think that's such a fun idea. And I admire people that can interpret somebody else's ideas, um, emotion, because it, it's emotion. I mean, art is all about emotion, right? And right. how it makes us feel. It's how we feel when we're creating the art, gets into the art and how the person feels when they're looking at it. it's the, the reason we can go to a museum and we can all stand in front of the same piece of art and some of us are going to be jumping up and down in excitement from the way it moves us some of us are going to be completely unmoved and some of us are going to um just feel it in our heart we're going to feel it in our gut it was just um it just clicks with us you know and we mm -hmm. just need to keep experimenting either with it as creatives we need to experiment until we find that kind of art i mean some of you know my story that I started off as a writer and then started playing with, with paper and I did mixed media. And I enjoyed all the, those creative modes. And I mean, when I was writing and when I was publishing, you know, that was definitely filling my heart. And when it was no longer filling my heart, that's when I started looking to, the, to art for something else. And while I enjoyed everything else I did before Stitch, it wasn't until I started exploring texture with Stitch that I felt myself come alive. And I think there's a difference in the art I create as a result of that. So if you are a creative that's in any way tentative about creating, maybe you just need to play around with some different mediums. Maybe you just need to find something else that really gets you all excited. Saw a few people pop in, Shauna popped in. Yeah, the Zooms are a lot of fun. Um, I do charge $11 <coughs> for the Zooms. I do a morning one and an afternoon one for California times so that I can try and hit all the time zones. We rarely manage to stay just an hour. It always seems to run over and I keep the group small so that we can have a chance to really get to know each other at a deeper level. And it's a safe place. If you're having some creative struggles, it's a safe place to come and talk face to face. So if you're in my Facebook group, you will see the announcement go out. I don't talk about it um, outside of my lives. I don't talk about it on other social medias because it's not a place to offer, um, you know, for a hundred people to come in. It's not a webinar. It's a place. It, it's sort of like getting together in the coffee house. Barbara said, I've been wanting my artwork to more deeply embody my spiritual life. It feels like a calling and I'm not sure how to move in that direction. I've gotten as far as using my favorite symbols. Interesting. Um, what kind of art do you make, Barbara? Yeah, I'd be interested in, in the chat. Anybody have any suggestions for Barbara as well as um, anything that Marie and I can come up with? I think you're, you, the first step in doing something with your symbols, direct, finding your symbols is good. Learning your own vocabulary and from what I know about Barbara, she does art journals and she uh, used to do a lot of quilting. I don't know that she does as much of that anymore, mm -hmm. but she's doing a lot of art and she's a Zentangle. Really, really Ooh. beautiful Zentangle. Yes. Yeah, I mean. Um, How do you convey your, connect your spiritual life to your art? How do you connect your mindfulness to your art, Maria? How do you think that happens? That's, that's a hard one. Yeah, I think you, if you're talking about the practice itself, I think art in itself is a mindfulness practice. You know, if you just focus on 
doing the art and just sitting there and maybe you make it into a little ritual, you know, you set up your space, um, make it very special, put on a candle, you know, what, what kind of, you know, like you're making your, your art space into some sort of very spiritual space, right? And then um, when you start practicing, when you start um, painting, then I think that will bring that aspect to it automatically. I like that idea of having a ritual that goes with it. Oh, Barbara said, uh, really just art journaling. I do art journaling in books, traveler's notebooks, my daily book, but I'll also work with larger formats when I'm inspired. And I'm reminded there's, um, I can't remember who it was. I think it was on doing more YouTube videos or doing better at your YouTube videos or something like that. Um, and the guy said that uh, the only thing wrong, oh, he was getting evaluated. And the only thing wrong with the guy's videos was there was just like nothing that connected the beginning to the ending. And so the guy got a bell and he rang a bell when he started the video. And when the video was over, he ended with the bell. And I thought that was such a simple thing that we could apply to our art practice too. If you had a bell or a little mini gong or a particular piece of music that you, you know, just had like a 30 second clip of and you played before, and then you did it at the ending and you, you set your starting and ending points of your ritual. I like the idea of something like that. What do you mm -hmm. think? Yeah. And especially a bell. I think that's, that's uh, such a great um, sound too. I'm just remembering my son and his uh, wife at their wedding, they handed out little bells um, as well. We rang them throughout the ceremony, but uh they handed out bells as little gifts. I'm going to put one right over here by my desk. I really like that idea. Thanks for bringing that up. Kimberly said, Barbara, you might try doing some journaling spiritually oriented right before you begin creating. Barbara said, I make a ton of birthday cards and I like those best when they reflect my inner space. Yeah. Denise said, hey, Denise is coming out of lurk mode. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, art journals are personal experimental. I think that physically... Journaling our keys to uncover what is hidden. Barbara, do you feel, I know you do soul collage. Do you feel like that embodies your spiritual life or is that a different path? Yeah, Kimberly said in my message, I'm referring to journal writing, right? Doing some physical writing into your journal before you pick up your art. Or a phone with a sweet chime for the time, chime for the timer, exactly. Barbara says, I have a meditation app on my iPad, which has those big, big gongs as starters. And what is it? You know, when I was writing, um, of course, one of the big things was to use all your senses. And the other thing, you know, Maria's suggestion about using a candle. When a candle starts, you get that candle flame and you smell that. You can't help but smell that. It's not the same with the battery candles, which is what I use mostly anymore. But if there was, if you like incense, um, if there's something you can do with the five senses, you're going to physically maybe write just a couple sentences. I intend to embody my spiritual life in my art. I'm going to click my, my gong and I'm going to light my candle. And uh, maybe you have like a Tic Tac or some little something that you can put the taste in your mouth. You get those five senses awake and that becomes part of your ritual. I know when I was writing novels, I had a particular piece of music. I played Liebestrom every time I sat down to work on this particular book. And after a while, it becomes this Pablo kind of, you know, thing in your brain that when you hear it, you have to sit down and write. Yeah. And uh, one of the interesting things too about the the senses is it, it can be a real good mindfulness practice too. Um, to come back into the now. So right. when you sit down and you actually go and say like, okay, um, what do I smell? What do I see? You can even do an exercise, something like um, go through the colors of the rainbow and see, okay, I want to find the red things in my room. I want to find the yellow things in my, you know, orange is next. Okay. Orange, yellow, you know. <laughs> so it goes <laughs> 
Um, but yeah, like, and then, and then it actually brings you back into the moment, into the now, because you're not thinking about something in the future or in the past, you're thinking about right now, right? And the same with like the sounds, like what can you hear? And, you know, do you hear some birds outside your window? You know, maybe a fan or what do you hear? Those kind of things. Or how does it, how does the chair feel on your body? You know, and when you do this before you start the art, bringing yourself back into the moment, I think that really, um, you know, brings you into this creative flow as well and into this connection to um, your spirituality. I love that idea. And, and it reminds me of something I read about um, how to how to break a panic attack, because you have to bring yourself, of course, back into the moment. Mm -hmm. And it's something like, tell me three things you see right now, three things you feel right now. So it's the same sort of a thing. Um, Wow, I would love to get together and and just kind of brainstorm some. Uh, I'm going to have to sit down and brainstorm some potential rituals. Sounds are easy. A physical thing is easy. Taste. What could we easily add? You know, we don't necessarily want to be popping a piece of chocolate every time. Although there's nothing wrong with chocolate. <laughs> but what can we do for a taste? Well, you can just taste your own mouth. I guess. <laughs> just yeah, well, that's strange. true. Remember that. A little strange. You could have um, maybe part. Oh, this would take care of too. It would take care of smells. What if you had something like an orange or a peach or some kind of fruit that that had a really strong. I mean, mm. I oranges. You slice the orange. You smell the orange. You taste the orange. Yeah. You know. Then you hit your song. Yeah, and you look at your orange. You can feel the bumpy texture. Hmm. Oh, Barbara's listening to Leave a Strum. Yeah, I just, uh, it was a great background piece for me. Sharon said, I don't know that I set out to create mindfully, but the act of creating definitely puts me in on a mindful and reflective state. It's one of the many reasons I love it so much. Yep. Barbara said, I just realized that a key piece is separating the spiritual mindful arting from the rest of being on the desk in front of the screen. Oh, so are you thinking like when you're, when you're doing your live streams, when you're recording a video? Oh, Terry. Yes. T gosh, T what a wonderful oh, way. Yeah. Absolutely. That is it. Running mm -hmm. cold water on your hands for feel. Oh, that's a good one because that's it good. definitely brings you back to the moment. And if you thought that you had like one of those racing squirrel brains, not that I have any experience with that personally, mm -hmm. <laughs> um, you could have a little bowl near you with some ice cubes and just kind of every so often stick your fingers in the ice just to kind of like shake you back into that. Yeah, Barbie, peppermint candy or something or even a breath spray. Margaret says, I like the bell idea of the five senses. I can't use anything perfumed anymore. I will have to find something with a smell I'm not allergic to. What about tea, Margaret? I love Terry's suggestion of tea. And it does smell too, yeah. Yeah, it's got a great smell. Even the physical act of opening, you know, whatever the container is that the tea is in, the, the warmth of the cup or the feel of the ice. Barbara said, for me, taking the sketchbook outside with a pencil and eraser is a good way for me to alter the landscape of my day. Yeah, working in a different location or flip side, having the same location so that it's your, you know, your, your place is set up. And if you haven't set up a creative place that is just your spot for creating, I really recommend it because your brain then gets conditioned to create when you're in that space. Kimberly said, Stephen King has special music to write with for each book. Yep. And a lot of writers will put their playlists in the back of the book. Kimberly, focusing on your breathing brings you present. Yes. And learning the, um, what is it? Uh, so I've heard so many different numbers, seven, four, 10, whatever it is, the breathing in, holding, and then breathing out. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, you can do whatever number. I mean, <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> the number is not really important. It's more like the uh, the action itself, right? So do you have a regular mindful practice? Like, do you meditate every day, Maria? 
I do meditation. Um, I do, um, as I said, with, with my art, I usually, I put on a candle. Um, and I also do something recently because I'm a bad procrastination person. <laughs> Same here. <laughs> so um, usually I do a sitting with discomfort practice. Oh, yes. Please tell them about that. I thought that was such a fabulous idea. Yeah. So essentially what you do is um, when you want to start working on something, oftentimes we feel um, kind of like, um, yeah, I don't really want to do this. Or, you know, you want to procrastinate, find some excuses um, why you can't do this. And, and usually what you know, why do you have to get up or this, this other thing that needs to be done yet? Um, and usually the practice goes like this. Um, you, you try and stay sitting, even if you feel like you want to get up. And um, you just kind of feel into this uncomfortable feeling. Um, so sitting with it. Like it's, it's okay. And, you know, you can you tell yourself it's okay to be uncomfortable. And being uncomfortable is part of the process. And the reason why I'm procrastinating and un being uncomfortable is uh, means that this is important to me, right? And um, I can sit with it. And then um, another thing maybe to remember is that feeling stuck or this whole you know blank page syndrome and so on is, you know, to try and in, integrated into the creative process like this is part of it like this is normal to feel and it's okay to feel it because even if we do these practices the discomfort is likely not going to go away you're going to still going to feel like that right you know you can't there's no magic pill against it and and so what we can do is become okay with it embrace it you know, include it as part of our process. This is like, okay, I'm sitting down. This is the part of my painting where I'm sitting here and being uncomfortable and don't want to do it. <laughs> <laughs> do you have like catchphrases that you repeat to yourself in these situations? Yeah, so mostly mostly um, it's this, you know, it's okay to feel uncomfortable. You know, discomfort is okay. Um and you know, I, I I can, you know, I can, I can do it even with discomfort. So there's kind of like that in that realm. Not exactly. It changes. Like every time I'm I do it, it's like a little bit different, but it's in the same sentiment. Do you think it would be helpful for people? And and I'm speaking, you know, to both artist Maria and um, mindfulness much more expert than I am, Maria, um, to like brainstorm like a list of some phrases that you could repeat to yourself uh, Absolutely. in various, yeah. various situations. I mean, what kind of things could we tell ourselves that remember to breathe? I, I love that. Thank you. Um, Kimberly said, breathe out more counts than in. So that's a really good thing. You don't need to think about the number, just breathe out more counts than in. Um yeah, I think definitely um, some sort of mantra is always helpful. I think, um, you know, kind of like in, in line also with what we've been doing in our art courses, um, remembering why you're doing this and who are you doing it for? Um, you know, if it's important work, um, something you don't want to do, but it's important, you know, why is it important to you? And, and, and remembering that. And remembering the person, and maybe even envisioning, envision, eh, in, uh, sorry, <laughs> envisioning, <laughs> envisioning the person that you, you know, and what, what, what is there, you know, how would that benefit them? So if you do that, then it's a lot easier to do the work because I, I noticed by my, for myself too that doing stuff for other people is a lot easier than yeah. doing the stuff that I just, you know, decided to do for for myself or, yeah. It, it's just true because when I'm looking at doing it for myself, I fall too often into the trap of 
well, I'm doing this, but somebody else is doing that and they're going to either do it better, faster, make more money at it. More people are, you know, I can, I throw up all this little comparison game and, mm -hmm. you know, doing the comparison game really gets in the way of trying to do any type of mindful, creative practice. Um, so for me, my mantra has to be just, you know, stay in my own lane. Don't worry about what anybody else is doing. Uh, right. I could very easily right now, I'm looking at Maria's picture come to life and I'm thinking, holy cow, look what she's done <laughs> in the 45 minutes that we've been sitting here chatting. And I'm like still sticking myself with pins and yeah, I'm, I'm not, but I'm not going to play the compare game because we're not the same artists. We haven't walked the same life paths. And anytime we do that compare game, we fall short because there's no way you're going to be like that other person because you're not that other person. Right. And I just have to continually remind myself. So one of my mantras is stay in my own lane. And the other thing that I really like that we have learned in our program is how can we make it easy? We're so quick to throw mountains in our path and make things much more difficult than they have to be. What did Sharon say that was so wonderful? I have found that my mo the most mindful part of my day has become my daily's Pilates session, focusing on my breathing, my muscles, and how they are working. The focus turns to me. That's beautiful, Sharon. The focus turns inward. Yes. Yeah, and the, the, the beauty of mm -hmm. mindfulness is that you can really make any moment into a mindfulness moment. Any moment, it doesn't matter. Whatever you're doing, you can make it into a mindfulness practice. Even if you just vacuum or if you brush your teeth, you know, you can, if you just sit and fully be there in that moment and do the activity, it's a mindfulness practice. I right? love that. I love that. Margaret said, My daily walk is that for me. I don't always yes. want to be bothered but it changes my whole being. Yeah, Denise, walking meditation is great. That's Denise fantastic. said, there's only one you. No one is going to create what you do in the same manner. Absolutely. Yes. So I'm going to ask a difficult question, and I want Maria's answer, but also if anybody else in the in the chat has any ideas, how do you define, define mindfulness? You know, is it just a buzzword that we throw around? I don't think so. But how would you define, um, you know, what m mindfulness is, okay, and I'll tell you my definition, um, is just being present in the moment. Mm -hmm. But does anybody else have a different definition, what mindfulness might be for them? So for me, that's exactly it too, but um, I would probably add attention as well. Attention to self, attention to the moment, attention to what? Attention to anything. Okay. Like f actually paying attention. Oh, paying attention. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Cause we're always in a hurry to get through everything. Right. And what's the rush? Unless we are performing life-saving surgery, there's no rush. Right. Oh yeah. Uh, Barbara was talking about Thich Nhat Hanh. Yes, yeah, definitely. Um, actually on my podcast, mindfulness podcast, we have actually done also a book review of one of his books. Um, but um, we did the one that was called, no, no, it escapes me. Uh, the Art of Living, I think. Yes, that was it. The Art of Living. I remember watching or listening to that one. Yeah. And it's just very beautiful. Yeah, definitely. Take that hand. It's one of the, unfortunately, passed just last year, I think. Yeah. Definitely. Great Exhaling all the negative. A friend of mine used to say in with love, out with hate while using hands to pull in towards you and push away while saying it. This is incredibly cleansing. I love this exercise. Look at this. You know what's funny? The in with love, uh, I mean, that's 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 a good one, but you can even turn it around and do it the opposite. And oh. sometimes just do it where you say you eat, you devour the negative you digest it and then you can like you can send out love i love that devour right? the hate and send out the love i love it so both ways it works both yeah ways. 
the other book Barbara mentioned, um, Present Moment, Wonderful Moment with Meditations for All the Daily Activities. I love that. Yeah, that was a little more uh, practical. Um, yeah, a little bit more um, hands-on, right? Hey, Liz, I didn't say hi to you. She says mindfulness is focusing on mental health within a specific moment. Well, I like that. Denise said it's being an observer versus reactant to situations. Yeah, that's good too. Yeah, yeah. The pause, right? The pause. And why are we so afraid? Okay, why are we as a society so afraid to pause and observe the moment? Why do we feel like we have to react to every moment? Why can't we just be still and sit in that discomfort, as Maria said? Why are we afraid of that? Well, because we never learned how to do that. Like, just, it's, it's something you have to learn. Um, because your body, right, and your mind are trying to save, keep you safe. Yeah. It's a survive, you know, you, you, you survival tap into movie. your survival instincts and being mindful. Um, you can't be in a survival mindset if you want to be mindful. Right. Um, so, and stress, of course, is going to any kind of stress in our lives is going to bring up that survival mindset that we're going to have to fight to overcome. Kimberly says mindfulness is being open, curious, non judgmental in the presence yes. to what is happening. Yes. Yeah, the non-judgmental part is also very yeah. really important. And so hard. So hard. And nobody, I guarantee, nobody in the world is going to judge you as hard as you're going to judge yourself. Yes. So quit doing it. <laughs> Sharon said, I think giving yourself permission to be in the moment and block out the chaos of the world is so important for mindfulness and so necessary in life. Yeah. Yeah, giving yourself permission. You got it, Philippa. Conditioning. Yeah, it's all conditioning. We've been conditioned to react to the moment. Like every problem has to be solved. Well, maybe a problem can't be solved. Maybe a problem just needs to be experienced. Maybe it's accepted, yeah. the lesson that we're going to learn from it. And sometimes we don't know those lessons until years later. Yes. Liz said, because we were taught to hurry up and wait in most schools. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, wouldn't it be wonderful if mindfulness was taught to our young people today? Absolutely. So Sharon important. said, I don't think we're afraid. I think we're conditioned to go, 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 push, push, push. We're never encouraged to be still. Barbara said, the world around us is getting more and more reactive. All the more reason to become less and less reactive. I like the idea of inhaling the chaos and transforming it in the fire of your heart. <gasps> How beautiful is that? Inhale the chaos and transform it in the fire of your heart. That's yeah, perfect, Barbara. There's the hope. Terry said, many people feel that we need to be productive or moving forward at all times, rushing every moment. Wouldn't it be wonderful if we could instead if our version of productivity could be showing by example how much richer our lives could be if we could slow down and observe the world around us and just teach by example. I mean, I, I picture, and I'm sure there's probably been commercials or, or indie shorts done like this, <coughs> where there's like this racing crowd of people all over the place and one person stops and is just mm -hmm. staring <coughs> and then another person stops and another person stops and the whole world stops just to be one in that moment. You know, if we could just lead by example and as creatives um, in the program that Maria and I are in, you know, we talk about not being influencers, but being leaders. We have an opportunity to lead by example with our creativity and showing people that we don't have to race. I don't have to finish 25 stitching projects in a month. I don't have to finish 25 stitching projects in my lifetime. I only mm -hmm. have to stitch every day with meaning and intent. Terry said, mindfulness is balance for the chaos of the mindless motion. That's another great one. Mindless motion. Oh, boy. How many of us have experienced that? Whoops. Is that yeah, one? this Down is crushing. You have to do something. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and if you if you don't do something, you're lazy. Like people can't even sit and do nothing anymore. No, they don't know how. They right. don't know how. And yet, as a child, I was told, um, you know, of course, I was a child of the '60s. You know, to be seen and not heard. Yeah. So I have a lot of experience with just sitting still because <laughs> that was the way. 
<laughs> that was, and that's probably why um, I became such an introvert is because I wasn't, sorry, my fingers keep slipping back over the stuff. Um, I wasn't encouraged to speak my mind. I was encouraged to quiet, not necessarily quiet my mind, but just quiet my mouth yep. and just sit still. Barbara said, since I retired in 2013, I've treasured having no goals and no timetables. I was on a monthly deadline producing a newspaper. I'm so relieved to be done with that. Yep. Margaret said, there was a point in time when achieving became the only worthwhile goal. It wasn't like that when I was growing up. People were more content. And how much of that is a gender thing? Okay. You know, women were not necessarily taught to achieve. We were taught to, you know, get married and raise a family and keep a house, right? We weren't taught to go out and achieve anything. Go to college? No. Have a full-time job and still raise a kid? No. Sharon said, mixed messages, Susan. Be seen and not heard, but don't sit idle. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Denise said, oh, my, I always say that, being seen and not heard as a child. Yeah, I don't know that as a child anybody ever asked me what I was thinking. No. You know, didn't have those kind of conversations. And I think, I think about all the missed opportunities for fabulous conversations. Oh my goodness. So many missed opportunities to learn, you know, what the child's mind is thinking because they're not, I mean, as adults, you know, we're, we're conditioned, like we were saying, you know, this goal, you know, let's finish this project and turn this in. And the kid's saying, Ooh, paint, water, this is fun. Okay, I'm done now. Can I can I go stab something with with a needle and thread? Okay, I'm done now. Can I go run around the block? Um, what if we lived our days more like the child that we were? And what if we asked ourselves the questions that we wish somebody had asked us as a child? What do you wish somebody had asked you when you were a child? Yeah, and the excitement, oh, right? That excitement. As a child. I mean, I see it in my child now. I have a six-year-old and uh, just sometimes seeing her running down the hall, like, I oh, have yeah, something. She's doing something. She has something that she wants to do, right? <laughs> it's and it, the, the endless, yeah, everything is new and wonderful. Terry said, when I was in my 20s, I felt like I was wasting time while I slept. Guilt. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And we Didn't still feel that now, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. All this wasted time. But time isn't wasted. Skill is wasted. Talent is wasted. People are wasted by not living to their potential. And I don't mean full potential. I didn't say full potential. But stepping into your potential as a human being. I mean, what, oh, what a ride. What a ride when you finally realize. And I think that, okay, Barbara, Margaret, um, the, the, those of you that are here, women of a certain age, sorry, Marie, I can't include you in this one. <laughs> there is a freedom that comes as we reach a certain age, isn't there, of saying, I don't give a rip what the rest of the world thinks. I am doing this for me. I am doing this because it makes me happy in the moment. I am doing this because it fulfills me in the moment. I never thought about being fulfilled when I was a young mom raising kids. I didn't, I didn't even know that was an option. It was just an obligation. Not that I didn't love my kids and love raising my kids, but it was an obligation. I had an obligation as the wife and as the mom to do these things. Nobody ever asked me what would fulfill me. Yeah, definitely different nowadays. Not completely, but. Yeah, hopefully getting better. Yeah. Um, I want to know, what would you ask your child self? Maria, what would you ask your child self? Um, probably like what, you know, what makes you happy? What do you, yeah, what you want to do, right? What I are would. some things that that uh, bring you joy in life, you know? And I don't know. Sharon said, I wonder if that's why you became an author, Susan. So many thoughts that needed to be heard. Absolutely. I wrote the stories that I needed the answers to. I had so many questions and so many things that I needed to say. And 
when I felt like I had answered all my questions, I stopped writing. You know, I mean, I still write, but it wasn't like my um, my compulsion anymore because I felt like I had answered the questions that I needed to answer for me. Sharon said, my mom was amazing. I always, um, I was always asked about my thoughts and validated in that respect. And I never mm -hmm. felt guilt for sleeping. My mom encouraged it if we needed it. Wow. That's so fantastic. Margaret said, when I turned 70, I thought, okay, that's my three score years and 10. The rest is for me and has no rules. Yes. <laughs> As a migraine sufferer, sleep was very necessary. Good that you know that, Sharon, and that your mom knew that. Philippa said, has been very hard to process the 1950s of the housewife with the 1960s of women having a voice. Still battle this one. Yeah. And when you span a generation, I was born in the 50s, was a kid in the 60s. Um, you span generations. It's difficult to reconcile. And then you try and be relevant in today's world. I mean, that's what I'm finding for me. It's like, you know, who wants to hear the rants of a 65 year old woman when there's the, you know, 30 year old teeny boppers out there be bopping around in their little perfect bodies doing their little perfect influencer stuff. Um, but, you know, I don't care. Well, I'm there you go. You have I'm doing it for everyone me. that's on the stream, for example. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And, you know, but it's it's like the head games that we play with ourselves, the, the ways we can talk ourselves out of being successful, mm -hmm. whether we're afraid or we're conditioned or we're, we're just nervous about being judged. Barbara said, Carl Jung said, uh, what did you do as a child that made the hours pass like minutes? Herein oh, lies the key to your earthly pursuits. Isn't that fabulous? Yes. Barbara said, Margaret, me too at 70. That was when I retired. I'm about to turn 80 in August, still playing. Yep. Oh, Kimberly, fabulous. She said, I always spoke my mind. I was not going to be oppressed and miserable like so many women, college and PhD were what I wanted since high school. Tough being unsupported, but I'm happy I did it. Ah, good for you, Kimberly. That's fabulous. Margaret said, Philippa, I was 21 when the 50s turned to the 60s, and I absolutely embraced it. And you are still, Phil, uh, Margaret, absolutely still. Hey, Liz, thanks for hanging with us for a while. Go have some dinner. Hope you're having something yummy to eat. Oh, can you imagine it's almost an hour already? It's, see, this is what happens when you get talking with people that have a, a, a creative mindset. The conversation never stops. It's fantastic. Terry said, my hours pass like minutes when I'm making art. Yep. Mm -hmm. Philippa said, I was a small town girl and the 1960s uh, were confusing. Sharon said, I think every age and every generation has worth to share with others. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. I think some generations find it easier to believe that than others, though. That's true. Well, and, you know, just like thinking about even what I can learn from my six-year-old child, it's crazy. Well, and I think it's wonderful that you realize that you can learn things from your six-year-old child. Yes. You know, because so many people think, oh, it's a kid, you know, come back to me when you're, you know, when you've got your college degree. No, Barbara said... I have a question for Maria. Yes. Are you drawing from a photograph or from memory? Um, I'm using a reference photo. Well, actually, it's not true. I use multiple reference photos. Um, and I'm kind of designing the scene. And then I'm, you know, flipping between the different reference photos and, and putting it together. But Can yeah, I do, I do look at the pictures. Um, um, yeah. Did you... Oh, Susan? I think we lost Susan. <laughs> I didn't think about that. I I would meant to just take off my camera. I was going to say I'll take off my take me off of the camera. Um nope, I guess I can't do that. Shoot, I can't just take off the camera. I wanted to make just you. I'll be quiet for a minute if you can hold yours up. I'm going to take me out for a second. 
if okay. you can hold yours up because then I can make you full screen. Ah, yeah, yeah, okay. Sure. Okay, go ahead and do that and then I'll take this. So this is the, the orange tree and here's some cushions. Um, still kind of like halfway, I think halfway. But I can't believe that, that, I mean, of course you had your sketching done before um, before we started, but that's fabulous that you've made that come to life in that amount of time. And I've still got pins <laughs> in my thing, but I've been reading chat. I'm gonna give myself a pass. I'm reading chat. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, some paintings, depending on how, um, it really depends. I was trying to keep it somewhat loose on this one so I don't take so much time. Yeah. Um, um, because, yeah, I don't want it to get, um, I wanted this to be a mini portal. <laughs> I was trying, I was say, Barbara, you're saying on StreamYard there's a way to make her screen bigger. I'm trying to figure out how to do that and not lose my audio. That that's the thing I hadn't figured out how to. Yeah. Oh wait a minute! I wonder if that's what these little things are up here. Oh, you can uh, can't you do stop cam on the bottom? Well, when I tried to do that, it shut off my shut my audio camera too. at the same time. I can't shut off. I think maybe because I'm the host. Oh, but can you still hear me? Whoops. Wait a minute, I lost. Huh. Okay. I lost you. There we go. No, I turned off my cam and it's Yeah, like, you I'm... can do it, but I think it's because I'm the host that I can't because when I turn me off, it takes me out completely. Okay. I can I can just mute my mic, but I can't stop just the cam. Hmm. Interesting. It's one of those things. Barbara said, I love the cushions underneath the orange trees. How lovely. And the orange trees bring me to a wonderful scent from my childhood. I had orange trees outside my bedroom window. Mm, that's beautiful. Terry said, I accused my daughter of knowing everything when she was three. She said that she did know it all, but her face would hurt if she told it all to me. <laughs> <laughs> that's fantastic. Oh, yeah, my, lovely. my daughter was very much the independent one when she was a child and, uh, didn't I didn't know enough to ask her a lot of the questions that that you know we're talking about now but she definitely kept her own mind and I'm really glad that for whatever reason she was that independent self yeah. it made hard times but <laughs> yeah that's my daughter she's very independent and very she knows what she wants, which is makes it hard. And a very good haggler. I need to take her to some sort of market or something. <laughs> <laughs> Margaret said, very peaceful scene, Maria. Thank you. So does anybody, I told Maria I'd only keep her about an hour. Does anybody have any questions or anything else that they want to share before we sign off? Because this was just an amazing talk. I'm going to go back and pull the transcript and see what I can glean out of there for us. Yeah. Old soul. Yes. She's an old soul, your daughter, Maria. Yeah, probably. Um, but yeah, an old soul, but with a, uh, with the, not the responsibilities of an old soul, because I think that was one of the, that's exactly one of those things. I think that uh, sometimes people are told they're an old soul, but it's like, because they're um, nice or like quiet and not, stubborn or not you know like not going against the parent ah. <laughs> so um i don't i don't want that for sure because my philosophy to... my philosophy with parenting is um i'm, I'm into gentle parenting so for my own philosophy is that the child is a person just like an adult and just because they don't have the life experience doesn't mean they don't deserve the same respect and i also feel that um the only things like I don't usually like I'm not permissive, but I I think about is it necessary to forbid something if it's not necessary out of safety or health concerns, you know, like, OK, like, yeah, you're not going to eat chocolate before bed. Right. But um, I think most of the most of the things that we are we were told no as a child. You could really ask the question why. Yeah. Why? Why? Yeah. 
probably I, because it was a, a, a discomfort for the parents. Yeah. Right? <laughs> I love it. Yep. Barbara says, thank you for the afternoon stream. Remember, thumbs up, everybody. Margaret said, thanks for joining us today, Maria. Lovely to be introduced to you and your art. Okay, those of you in my group, those of you that hang around, Barbara, I am looking at you. We need to do this, you and me. I know you're comfortable with streaming, so we need to do this and have a play date. Anybody else that wants to do a play date? Sharon, you ready to jump back onto YouTube? You and I, we need to do this. Yeah. So hit me up. Maria and I can come back again. Maybe next time Maria will host it on her channel. And again, it's a great way. Any of you guys that do streaming, consider doing this with a friend and do the letting them stream to the other channel because it's a great way to expand your reach, do some cross-pollination, and get to know some other creatives. This has been a fabulous conversation. Yes, absolutely fabulous. Thank you all for being here with me. And I'll see you next Wednesday, my regular time. I suppose I will continue to work on this piece, which in my head is going to be a vessel, but it could be a book. All right, everybody. We'll see you next time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.